All right, Nate. Today is the day. I got the whole look. Got my over ear headphones. Got my unfixed hair. I'm rocking the vibe. I got some lo fi beats going on in here. I'm going to show you Mango. It's going to be amazing. All right, so first thing. Um, I believe that I have you on the Mango repo. If not, I'll send you an invite. I mean, you must be because you've already started playing with it. Um, okay, so here's what you do I'm in my sites. I'm in my sites and I'm going to run this. Okay, run npx mango dash cms at latest to make sure you have the latest one. You don't have to like install anything. NPX will just grab this package and use this to install mango. Uh, NPX mango dash cms at latest and then run create and then the name of your project, which we're just, I'm just gonna say test. Okay. Yes, that's great. Mango CMS 0.0.5. All right. So it's gonna run through this stuff. Um, this isn't necessarily the way that I want Mango to be used once it's released, but this will give you more flexibility to kind of see what's going on. This should do a better job of like error logging and stuff for you. So you can trial and error a little bit with things and you can see the actual backbone code of Mango. So if things aren't working right, you can kind of follow it and see what's going on because it's not documented in any way. Um, there's like some example stuff in there, which we'll, we'll get into that kind of guide you in the right direction, but it's not clearly documented. I really need to do that. And I really want to do that. I want to make this an actual thing. <laughs> <clears throat> all right there we go so this says it's installed so you can start the back end by going cd test mango cms dev then you can start the front end by doing all this this is actually untrue because of the way that we just created it like i talked about where it shows more error logs and stuff so we have a couple of quick little tweaks that we need to make so that this will work okay so first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to cd into test Okay, and we need to make these two tweaks to make it work. Um, we need to rename, here I'll show you, there's three folders in here, front, mango, and mango CMS. Mango CMS is actually the backbone of mango. And then this mango folder is just your configuration for mango. So the way I want it to work when it's done is you just have front and you have mango, which is your mango config. But we're gonna rename these things so that this works for now. I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna rename mango to config and I'm going to rename mango CMS to mango. So now it should look like this. You got config front mango um, to get mango started. Well here, now I'm going to open this project in VS code and I'll show you the way that I like to run these things. So test. All right. It's open up here in VS code. What I like to do is we'll go and make another terminal. So we've got two of them here. And the first one will go cd mango yarn and yarn watch. Let me make this a little bigger for you. All right, so now mango is up and running. And to confirm that, well, let me show you. If we go to the settings, settings.json and config slash config, uh, the port that we've defined is 3001. So I'll show you how we can tell that it's up and running. If we go localhost 3001 slash GraphQL, this will actually load up. And we can query, for example, and there's already some data in there because I have an existing, um, I have an existing Mongo instance running that I already put some data in. So for you, it'll just come up with nothing. That's another thing to make sure, I don't know if you've installed Mongo. Um, if you haven't, you can do it pretty easily through you could just Google it. Um, it's pretty easy to get started. Just uh, install the MongoDB Community Edition. That's the free one. Um, but there's pretty easy installation instructions for macOS. So back to this. Here's what we've got. Mango's up and running. Um, and now in your second terminal, we'll CD into front. And we'll run yarn which installs all of our dependencies. Um, there's two like main dependency handlers. There's uh, NPM, Node Package Manager, 
and there's yarn. And when I started doing this, yarn was what all the cool kids were using. So I'm just used to yarn, but they're both essentially the exact same thing. Um, so you run yarn to install everything, or you would run npm install to install everything. And then you run yarn dev or npm run dev. And that will kick off our front end server. So this is Vite over here. Um, and it's running our front end, which is mad because... Okay, this is why we're doing a video. Remember, I renamed a couple of those things. Um, we're going to have to go and fix those two in this front end. So if we find Mango here in the helpers, we're looking for... We're going to rename these to config. Okay, same thing if we go mango and we go to this one that's capitalized. It's also going to be down in here. We're going to change this to config. Nope, that one's fine. Just this one. Config. I'll see if I can fix this front end stuff for you before. So maybe you won't have to do it. But in case I don't and I run out of time because it is 345. Uh, I will just do what I can to fix this for you. So this is in main. So take a look here. Uh, if you hold option and click these, it's super nice. It brings you right to the file, right to where it's being referenced. It's so nice. Um, but let's see, yeah. Config. Okay, so it's those three files. It's mango, it's, it's uh, in source helpers mango, source ca helpers capital mango, my pronunciation is not great. Source helpers capital mango. Um, and then also in main.js where you need to change mango slash config to config slash config. Um, change those three and it fixes everything. And let's go back here to this URL. Boom. Here's our mango starter. Now you'll see there's this little online guy here. And that means that it uh, sees the connection to the back end the mango server here which is running um, if I kill this then it's gonna say offline and if I start her back up then eventually it'll show online hey there we go okay um, so we're in our we're in our front end um, and this is connected to our back end the first thing that you do is create an account um, this just creates, well, let me give you, uh, let me give you a tour of, of how it all works. Okay. So in, I'm not sure how familiar you are with, uh, MongoDB, but MongoDB is comprised of collections and documents. So basically a collection, um, you can think of it as like a folder. Uh, it basically is defining like a type of document. So, um, Generally, for each type of data you want to store, you create a collection. So, for instance, in Church and Family Life, events is a collection. Members is a collection. Registrations is a collection. Uh, resources is a collection. There's all these different collections that hold these different types of data. Um, and then each entry in the collection is a document. And a document is essentially just like a JSON object. So this is going to be just like the JSON API that you had already on steroids. That's a great way to think about it. So the first thing that we do here is we can create an account, which this is just uh, just kind of a uh, abstraction to create a, a, a document in the member collection. Okay, so I'm going to say Colton Neifert. Whoops. Uh, whatever okay we hit create well in your instance you're not already gonna have data so whatever you're gonna hit create and it's gonna look like this so this is saying hey you're logged in is this guy uh, and then it's gonna give you just a dump this is the JSON for that document so this is what you just inserted into uh, the members collection you got an ID you got an email and the password obviously isn't stored as plain text, like Mango. See, this is what Mango does. 
it helps you with these kind of things. Um, the password, a, you, you know, when you when you set up a user account, the user would input their password, and then when Mango receives that input, it's going to convert it to this: a salt, a hash, and an API key. Um, and then there's already like a login feature built into Mango where they put in their username and password, and it checks it against this hash and, and says, "Is this correct or not?" So you don't have to worry about setting all that stuff up. Uh, that's pretty basic for like. The CMS, but this just gives you an idea of what's kind of going on. Um, first name, last name, title, all those things. Collection is members. Edit ID is null. Created, updated. These are timestamps. These are computed fields. When I built Mango, I was trying to take a lot of uh, cues from Vue because I really love Vue, and I don't know if you've gotten into computed, uh, computed. What do you call them? Computer properties in Vue. Um, but I thought, man, that's such a nice feature that I would love to use that on the database too. And so I have computed fields, uh, and so created and updated are these computed fields that just get evaluated uh, by Mango whenever you update a document um, or create a document. Uh, the slug is automatically generated too. That's computed. So um, I'll, I'll show you more of this later, but. Uh, let me let me now show you how how Mango is configured. Now that you have this idea, <clears throat> this is our Mango instance here. Let's go into. We're just going to look at the config. You don't need to actually dive into this code. It might be helpful if you're curious about stuff. But for all intents and purposes, let's look at. Okay, well, we will get into it a little bit. Um, Members. Okay, this is in one of the default collections, so this doesn't show up in the config because it's members is a default collection. Um, but it looks like this. This is a crappy example, really. Sorry, because it's a default collection. But you define your fields. Okay, so normally in your collection you're saying export default members. Uh, you're just exporting this object, right? It would be, it would look like this. It would look like this. Okay. Um, but here it's a default field. And so we're like providing ways to override the defaults and stuff. So it doesn't look like that, but that's normally the way it would look. Um, so you define the singular version of it that way. That's for querying purposes. Um, the, the plural is always going to be the name of the file. So members, and then the singular will be member. Uh, you define singular because when you query, you could query for members or member, you know, to get a, a singular. And it's not always easy to convert singular and plural. For instance, people or person. Um, so we define the singular in here. Permissions, okay? Uh, there's, there's just lots of things you can configure through Mango. Um, it handles a lot of this garbage for you, so... Uh, the public can create a, a, a member. Like, so if you're a new account, right, you don't have any credentials, you're public. And so the public can create a new account. Um, they're allowed to read accounts and they can create an account as long as they're not creating an admin account. And then if you're the owner of the account, you can update, delete, read. Um, and then, okay, so here's your fields. Email is a required field. Permissions public can create it. Owner can read it and update it. Regional facilitators can read. Um, but if you're public, you can't read it. So we have out here public can read members, but you can't read the email on a member. So you can't just if you're if you're a random guy, you can't just query for all my members and then get their email addresses. Um, and then you validate it here. Okay, so here's a field. The name of it is email. It's required. Here's its permissions. And then validate. And we define this validation function, which just checks to see if it's unique. So if it's a new email, great. If it's already existing, hey, it's going to say, wait, an account already exists. Um, and then this is actually a translated input, which means it takes an input and then it does something to it to transform it. Um, so it's a translation, 
where we take the input and we convert it to lowercase. That way you can't have your email address starting with a capital letter and then create another account with your email address all lowercase. Um, and then the password. <clears throat> also, you have this kind of stuff, um, it, but it's translated again. Password actually has subfields like we looked at. It has salt, hash, API key. It is a translated input. The type of the input is a string. So it's just taking in a, like the input is a string. User just gives you a string and it's required. But then it gets translated by running this function where it does all this crypto stuff and gives you back salt and a hash. And then you have roles is another field where you have these are options that you have for your roles. Uh, admin, member, uh, you can add more, uh, but don't do it here. This is all inside the actual Mango code. You would do it out in your config. Um, and then this is what merges the config with, or actually overwrites this stuff with the config. So um, in, in users here, this is where you're actually kind of defining this stuff. So this is the users dot js in config and it, we're adding these two fields first name and last name don't worry about that uh and then hooks if you want to add any hooks but let me give you a better example um than members so let me back up a little bit in your config you can define all your collections you can also define automations, which are like cron jobs. So you can say every Friday at 3 p.m., do this or that or whatever. Um, there's this config stuff also, uh, which don't worry about these. You have these global fields like title, author, edit ID, created, and stuff. This is what I was talking about, where created is a computer field. So when the doc is created, um, this field, it, or the value for this field is written by Mango using, uh, by evaluating this function, okay? So it, it's going to be either that the doc.created already has a value, like if we're editing the doc, it already has a value. Um, but if we're creating a new doc, it, this won't have a value, so it will be this new date. And the type of that field is a float. Uh, same thing with updated. Um, slug, you see how that's computed. It's just taking the title, converting it to lowercase, and adding dashes instead of spaces and that sort of thing. Um, this kind of irrelevant stuff. We have endpoints here. So like if you need to do some kind of custom logic, like say you have a contact us form on your page, you don't have to like write some kind of a Lambda function or something somewhere. You can just throw it here in your endpoints. And the way this works is... <sighs> I need to actually switch this so that it uses the term endpoint. We were using controllers and we switched it to endpoints, which I did in the config, but not in the actual implementation. So this is test, okay? So if I go to, if I send a get request to uh, localhost 3001 slash test, it's gonna say Mango is online. If I send, you know, contact slash admin, if I send a post request to contact slash admin, it'll return, hey, you did this. Um, but this is how this kind of stuff works. So like if you wanted to say, you know, contact, and then you say post, then if you send a post request to contact, it's going to do whatever you put in here, which would be like maybe send you an email with the contents of the post request. I hope that makes sense. Um, fields. In here, you can define your own custom field types. So let me give you an example, okay? Here's the examples collection, okay? Remember a collection is like the type of data, so it could be blocks, all right? So let's say this is blocks. Um, let's actually, let's make it blocks, okay? Blogs, all right? This is now called blogs. The singular of this is blog. Let's say yeah, everybody can cre create, read, update, delete. That's a terrible idea, but for now, it's great. Um, so you see there's these fields, which all have like their schema. And I know that um, Mongo is schemaless, which makes it super great. Um, but it is good to throw some schema on here for you know, people's sanity. <laughs> it also makes Mongo a lot faster if the, you do hold to some sort of a schema. 
some sort of a form that can query a lot faster. But these are examples of different data types, okay? So you could have uh, a string. Let's make this, since it's a blog, let's make this like uh, the body. This is the body of the blog, okay? And by default, remember, it's going to have those uh, global fields on it. So it already has a title. Here's the body. Um, okay, you have, uh, this is just showing you the different types, kind of, because this is an example. So you can have an integer, you can have an array of integers, you can make anything an array. So this could be like an array of strings or whatever. Um, we don't need those for a blog. Um, an image, that's great for a blog. So we have, remember I said down here you can define different field types? Well, image is a default field type. And inside the image, there's all this logic to do this compression and to upload it to S3, do this storage stuff. So that's just an example of, you know, why you'd want to make a custom field type. It makes it super simple to not have to write that over and over again. You just call this image type and pass it your options. We're say we want to limit it to 500 pixels. Yeah, let's make it 1500 for your blog. Um, okay. And another field type is a relationship. Uh, we probably want, you know, by default, there's already an author, but let's say there's not. Okay, author would be um, a relationship uh, of, you know, it's going to be the collection it's relating to is going to be members. But you have to put the singular here because I could not figure out, a, I could not code myself out of this corner where it has to be singular, not plural. So right here, you put the singular value. Um, and because there's only going to be one author of a blog, we'll say single is true. If we didn't do this, you could link multiple authors. Um, you can do, this is just showing that you can do um, like nested fields. So let's say since it's a blog, we'll say posted from and then this just handles the exact same way that this stuff does. You can set, um, well, it doesn't actually. It's very similar, but you, so you just put fields under this, and then you'd say coordinates is your next field. <laughs> this is actually incorrect. You would actually do this. It's kind of annoying. And I would love to simplify that, but that's the way this works. Um, because you can do computed at any level. And let me explain what that means. This is a computed field. Um, I don't have a great example for why you'd want a computed field on a blog. Uh, yeah, I really don't know why you'd want a computed field on a blog, but there's gonna be times where you need a computer field. And it's so nice, to learn. they're really cool. Um, but basically you just give your field a name and then you put a computed property in there and define it. Okay, the, the first input it accepts is the doc. So um, it's gonna be all this stuff. So you might say, okay, let's say we want uh, your body is um, HTML and we need some like plain text for uh, the meta fields in uh, in your page. You need uh, your meta description. And so let me steal this from over here. Uh, all right, so here's your computer field. It takes it takes the blog. Right, that's the first um, argument passed there. So blog dot body, and uh, it's running this HTML to text library, which we didn't actually import in here, but this is just an example. And it does all this junk on your HTML of your uh, body over here, and gives you just plain text for uh, your blog body, and limit limits it to a thousand characters or whatever. So you could use that for your meta description. Um, that's an example of a computed field. And so you want a video for your field? Well, we've got this Vimeo. Sorry, you want a, a video for your blog and you use Vimeo. Uh, here's a Vimeo field with a translate input. So you're going to give it the ID 
the type is an int here, integer, because Vi Vimeo uses just integers for their ID. It's nothing complex. Um, so you give it this integer, and the translate input over here uh, gives you back your ID and your URL. So that way you don't have to throw this URL in front of the ID every time you know you want to uh, embed a video or whatever. So that's an example of how to use translate inputs, computed fields, uh, and just kind of normal stuff over here. Um, but the, the cool thing is, you know, Mango allows you to to do these kind of more complex things that you wouldn't get um, just serving JSON or whatever, you know. Um, some other neat things, uh, hooks. I'm not sure if you're familiar with hooks, but, uh, you know, a hook, is, you know, it's just calling a function at some point in the life cycle uh, of your app here. And in our app, in, in Mango, we have uh, three hooks, sorry, four hooks for um, collections, for documents being saved in a collection or updated, um, which are create, cre created, updated, deleted, and read. Those are your four hooks. So, for instance, created well, um, you can, sorry. So the created hook will run whenever a document is created in the blog section, in the blog collection. So you have created, and we'll do this. Sorry, I won't do that. We don't need to do that, okay? You probably don't know about that stuff yet. It's cool though. Um, so here's your document. Uh, you, you just created a new blog, so this, this gets run. Um, and here's the document. It's being passed into the created hook. So you could do something like send email and say, like, obviously I haven't imported this function either, but this is just an example. Wow. Does that kind of make sense? It gives you, it exposes the document here, and then you can run a function when it's created. Um, these can be super duper helpful. Uh, I'm sure there's like a million things that you can think of to do with these hooks. Um, but yeah, created, updated, deleted, and read are the four hooks that you can call in a Mango collection. Um, okay, I'm going to get rid of this because that doesn't actually work because we haven't imported that. Let me get rid of this too. But let's just give the example here. We'll keep this thing going, all right? So, okay, and then there's these global hooks that run whenever anything is done, created, read, updated, deleted. Um, so like, for instance, Algolia is this search engine. Um, and basically you store your data in your database and then you store the stuff that you want searchable in Algolia. So I have this like global hook on church and family life. So whenever anything is modified, uh, the modified content goes over to Algolia. So then it gets indexed for searching. That's an example of like a global hook and why you would want that. So I hope that that kind of makes sense as far as um, all the config stuff goes. But let me, let me show you really quick, okay, uh, from the playground here, now let's say we want to, and I don't know if you know anything about GraphQL, and I'm not crazy about GraphQL, but it gives us a sweet little API here just to get started. Um, we'll say mutation, create blog, because we have our blog collection, uh, and we'll pass our input here, which will be, whoops, title, new blog body this is lit okay and then we're going to respond with uh, um, it responds with the blog and the title and the body so if we do this creation it created it all right it ran this it created it and here's what it responds with this is our uh, our data let's do another one 
second blog. This is also lit, okay? So now we've created two of these, and I'll show you how to query with GraphQL. Query blog uh, title, okay? So it's gonna get new blog, but if I change this, sorry, I've got Peyton waiting on me right here, so now I'm kind of getting like fast, I need to stop. Um, if you go back to this and change it to blogs, then it will get multiple. Um, and you can do things here like limit uh, to a million or just one, you know, and then it gives you just one. Um, and you can search title, new blog. Let's get rid of this limit so you can see that it's searching it. All right, we don't have a limit anymore. It's searching, it's finding new blog. And you define what fields you want back here. That's the kind of cool thing about, um, about GraphQL. But 99% of the time, which you're gonna to wanna to use is the REST API. So that would be, instead of going to slash GraphQL, you go slash collection name. And here it gives you back the JSON response with all the blogs. It's gonna default limit them to 10, but you could say and, or you could put a query string in here, limit equals 10. It's kind of a pain in the butt to create these queries. And that's why we have some built-in libraries on the front end that will help you to query for these things. Um, and I will show you those things and how amazing they are and how simple they're going to make your life in the next episode. So let me know as soon as you get through this and I'll keep these coming. Thank you for your patience. I know it's been forever and I've been very sick, but I've been very much wanting to do this. So uh, yeah, it's exciting. I appreciate your uh, motivation and your enthusiasm, man. It's really encouraging. And hopefully, hopefully we can seriously be knocking out some projects this year.